Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just going to take a moment to raise this mic because I'm abnormally tall. Yeah, yeah, you weren't expecting me. A lot of people make that mistake. There we go. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Derek Froese. I'm the Associate Vice Chair for the UFE Alumni Association. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our expert panel event tonight on women in policing. Uh, we've got two hosts that are going to be hosting tonight, um, one of which will be joining us uh, momentarily. Uh, we have got uh, Dr. Erwin Cohen over here. And um, Dr. Cohen has been a faculty member of criminology and criminal justice in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice at the University of the Fraser Valley in Abbotsford, British Columbia since 2003, the director of the school from 2010 until 2013, and is currently the RCMP Research Chair for Crime Reduction and the director of the Center for Public Safety and Criminal Justice Research. Dr. Cohen received his PhD from Simon Fraser University and he's published one book, 38 scholarly articles and book chapters, wow, 108 reports, <laughs> and delivered 113 conference papers and workshops on a wide range of events, including policing, terrorism, youth justice, public policy, and public safety. You like to go for high scores, don't you? Big numbers in there. Yeah, is this, this is probably printed on her fridge, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're also gonna have a host, um, Dr. Amy Prevost, uh, Dr. Prevost is the director of the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice. Dr. Prevost received her PhD from Simon Fraser University for her work on violence and aggression among young offenders in custody. Amy teaches courses related to mental health, personality disorders, and crime. She is also a research assistant with the Center for Public Safety and Criminal Justice Research. Her main research interests are in the area of children's rights, children development, juvenile justice, and social policy, at-risk youth, and mental health and criminal justice. Amy is currently a member of the Matsqui Institution Citizen Advisory Committee. All right, there is a sign-in sheet that's at the back of the room. Uh, we're gonna be passing around. If you guys wouldn't mind filling that out for us, we'd just like to have an idea of who's here and get a count for uh, future information there. And uh, will you guys please help me welcome um, Dr. Cohen, who's gonna start hosting here. Thank you very much. Uh, just like to take a moment to thank you all for attending. I'd like to thank the Alumni Association for hosting and of course thank our esteemed panel for taking time out of their busy schedule to come and share their unique perspectives, knowledge, and experience on the important issue of women in policing. Uh, without any uh, further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the panel and, and begin our session. First, Margaret Shorter. Margaret earned a degree in marine biology from UBC before joining the RCMP. She worked for 19 years in plainclothes assignments, served as the operations non-commissioned officer at Richmond Detachment in Vancouver International Airport, and was the first female training NCO at E-Division and the first female advisory NCO in E-Division support services branch. Margaret was also appointed to the Vancouver 2010 Olympics Integrated Security Unit where she worked as a French and English bilingual member of the International Police Visitation Program. And after that, Margaret worked with E-Division's Border Integrity Program. As a retired RCMP veteran of 36 years, Margaret completed her master's degree in international intercultural communications in 2013. Please join me in welcoming Margaret Shorter. Our next door is Bonnie Riley Schmidt. Uh, Bonnie worked as a police officer with the RCMP from 1977 to 1987. She returned to post-secondary education later in life, earning a BA from the University of the Fraser Valley, a master's from Simon Fraser University, and a PhD in Canadian history in 2014, also from Simon Fraser University. As a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada scholar, Bonnie was also the recipient of the prestigious Dean of Graduate Studies Convocation Medal for academic excellence from Simon Fraser University for her PhD dissertation. In 2014, she was also voted as one of UFE's top 40 alumni. Her first book, Silence, the Untold Story of the Flight for the Fight for Equality in the RCMP, was published in September by Caitlin Press. Please join me in welcoming Barney Smith. Jane Hall joined the RCMP in 1977 and served for 21 years. 
She worked at North Vancouver, Surrey, and Langley detachments, as well as E Division headquarters, and was one of the first female members of the RCMP. In 2007, Jane published the first book on female members of the RCMP entitled The Red Wall, A Woman in the RCMP, which is an eyewitness account of the social, political, and legal influences on the RCMP from 1977 to 1998, from a grassroots police point of view. Please welcome Jane Hall. <laughs> Jennifer Schiffner received a BA in sociology from McMaster's University and completed studies in social service work and police studies at Sheraton College. She then joined the RCMP. Jennifer continued her education, taking certifications in forensic sciences, intelligence analysis, and human resource management. She received a master's degree in criminal justice from the University of the Fraser Valley. Jennifer served for over seven years as an instructor and facilitator at the RCMP's National Training Academy in Regina, Saskatchewan. The topics Jennifer instructed were in applied police sciences, firearms, and use of force. She currently works as a sergeant with the Surrey RCMP detachment in their training section. Jennifer Schiffner. And Stephanie Ash. She has been a police officer for 19 years, working in a number of areas in the Lower Mainland. She began her career in Coquitlam, where she took an interest in youth justice and sex crimes. She also worked on the Missing Women's Task Force, created and ran a domestic violence and mental health investigation team in Richmond, worked for national recruiting, and is currently the media relations officer for the Integrated Homicide Investigation Team. Stephanie was a journalist prior to joining the RCMP, obtaining a degree from BCIT in 1994. She received her bachelor's in general studies from UFE in 2007, followed by her master's degree here at UFE in 2011. She is also a member of the faculty at Kwantlen Polytechnic University. Stephanie continues to champion issues related to gender-based violence and women in policing. So to begin, uh, what I was hoping is if each of you can take a few minutes to talk a little bit about why and how you made the decision to work in policing, what has been the best thing about being a police officer, and what one thing that people would be, what is the one thing that people would be surprised to learn about you? Maybe we can start with Margaret. Test. That works nicely, thank you. <clears throat> well, why I became a police officer, oh dear. Um, I'm the, um, I'm the um, daughter of a career Mountie. That might sound obvious. I did a lot of things to kind of break away from there. So I did go to UBC and I did study marine biology and my aspirations were to work with Jacques Cousteau. <laughs> Don't laugh. I didn't figure out until very late in the program that that probably wasn't going to happen. And along the way, I had summer jobs with the force because my parents had moved around and I would go home in the summers to live with them. And I had the skills, I guess, and abilities to have a summer job with the force. And I gradually realized that probably my strengths weren't in science in a laboratory, that they were with people. And I had five siblings. Lord knows I had developed a lot of negotiation skills along the way. So that was the why. Um, after I graduated with my BSc, um, I kept going back to the force, so I did apply, and um, I think it was a better fit. Uh, the best thing about being in the police, I believe that's what you asked? Sure. Well, I'm going to narrow that down for you. The best thing about being in the RCMP um, was the opportunity for growth, and my whole life, I think, has been driven by um, a need to be a lifelong learner. Um, in that I took my second language training while I was go in the force, I was going to night school and so on, took immersion, I got accepted into an immersion program and so on. Um, but I had lots of opportunity to look around and find what was best fit for me and to find things that would, um, where I could make a difference, even in a small puddle. Even though the force is very big, I could find areas that um, I could contribute to and feel that it was meaningful. Um, the surprise? What would people be surprised about? <laughs> uh, one thing that didn't come out in my bio, which is an extension of my um, life with the RCP, was that along the way I got connected to the International Association of Women Police, and this is a global organization, a very 
um, unique and really diverse organization. And in that, I found the support outside of the RCMP in its many ways, in, many, in its many forms, where I could go to women who had similar experiences. And so I have always stayed with that organization as sort of a balance and um, support for me. And that has been a very nice offset for my policing career. Well, I'm a reader and I need notes because I will forget. So I do have something prepared, but I promise it's not going to be really long. But uh, what I've written does cover um, your three questions. My interest in the history of women in the RCMP, of course, stems from my own experiences as a member of the police force. In the 1970s, the RCMP hired a number of special constables, or specials as they were known, to perform criminal surveillance duties. Now, specials were an unusual type of police officer at the time, and a number of characteristics distinguished them from members of the force. For example, they were not subject to transfers around the country, but worked at static postings. They received less pay than uniformed members, even though they had full police powers. It was a difference that was justified by the fact that specials did not perform general police duties, wear uniforms, ride horses, or testify in court. These stipulations were meant to re preserve their anonymity as police officers. Now in those days, physical size and strength for uniformed police officers were viewed as absolute necessities when enforcing the law. But a physically imposing presence created difficulties for men attempting to blend in on the street during surveillance duties. Suspects had little trouble picking out a male police officer from a crowd. As a result, surveillance was an area of police work in which women excelled. Women had been working as surveillance in the IRCMP since the 1960s. In fact, their success was often referenced when the RCMP began to consider hiring women as uniformed police officers. In 1977, I was hired by the RCMP as one of these surveillance specialists. Now, because specialists were not issued with uniforms, we wore civilian clothing during our training at the RCMP's academy in Regina. It was during a firearms class that one of my instructors approached me about our civilian clothes. He informed me that whenever our troop was scheduled to arrive, the instructors made a habit of turning the heat down on the firing range so that the women would get cold and our nipples would stand out through our t-shirts. His comment revealed how the sexual harassment of female police officers began as early as their entrance into the academy. But it also spoke to the level of opposition to the presence of women who did not measure up to the physical standards of policing that were so highly prized by the RCMP. When I began work in the field, my surveillance duties included files such as drug importation, kidnappings, pedophiles, and terrorism. Perhaps the beginning of the end of my career with the RCMP can be attributed to the crimes committed by mass murderer Clifford Olson. Between November 1980 and July 1981, Olson murdered three boys and eight girls, all aged between 19, 9 and 18 years. The murders occurred within a 90 kilometer radius of Vancouver and fear gripped the entire city. The RCMP called in its surveillance teams to watch Olson, acquire more evidence, and ensure that he didn't commit more murders. Today I can proudly say that Olson never committed a murder during our watch. But the stress we experienced can best be summed up by a directive the RCMP issued to the surveillance teams who are watching him, and I quote, if any member on the surveillance has reason to believe there is immediate danger to any person who may have been picked up by Olson, any member should take whatever reasonable immediate action is necessary to control the problem." End quote. This seemingly benign directive belied the pressure we were under. It would be another three decades before I realized the personal toll working on this particular file had taken. Following his conviction, Olson spent the next 30 years manipulating the media, the courts, and the prison system. His narcissistic personality captured headlines and ensured that he maintained a media presence. I spent a sleepless night after seeing Olson during one of these television new newscasts shortly before his death in 2011. In a nightmare, I relived the fear that he would commit a murder while we were monitoring his whereabouts. My reaction surprised me. Even 30 years later, the fear still obviously lingered. I did remain in the RCMP for another six years after Olson was arrested, resigning in 1987. 
For me, the stress and strain of the work and the long hours with no social life had finally taken their toll. It was time to move on to another career. After leaving the force, I worked in a number of administrative jobs before returning to school. Silenced is my first book. It's not a memoir, but the history of women in the RCMP between 1974 and 1990. The book is based on my PhD research. I am passionate about the contributions, dedication, and fearlessness of the women of the RCMP. Their love of the work and their commitment to their communities is a history that all Canadians should know and understand. While the women of the RCMP did not consider themselves to be agents of change, and while they denied that they were making history, they undoubtedly were. The book is their story. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you all for taking the time and for Simon Fraser, or Simon Fraser, sorry, University of Fraser Valley uh, to, uh, to arrange this panel. I feel honored to be part of it. Thank you. Um, so timing and the time that you've taken, I take very seriously. And I have been very fortunate in the timing that I had in my life. I was born in 1954, right in the middle of the baby boom. And uh, I remember watching JFK when he said, we're going to go to the moon. And for my generation, we were going to do everything. Everything was possible. Um, I also watched the race riots in the United States. I also watched the CBC when it was covering the Royal Commission on the Status of Women in 1967. Um, and at that point, I, I didn't need a Royal Commission for most women to know we were being treated as second-class citizens. Uh, we weren't given equal opportunity for education or finances or even legally. Um, and I didn't like being second class. So when I was looking around, I sound like a feminist, but you know, back then I would not have said I was a feminist for a couple of reasons. One was the media really painted feminists as being, you know, man-hating, really radical people, not, not very flattering at all. And the other was, I was born in 1954, so I really was just a little too young to do anything but watch from the, the sidelines. I figured out pretty quickly you have to have a bra before you can burn one. But <laughs> I didn't mind that things were changing, and I knew they were. And when I was in grade 13, um, the guidance counselor came around and uh, they were tasked, and in Ontario they had grade 13 right up to about five years ago, I believe. Um, most people in grade 13 were heading to university and uh, his job was to get us information on what university, what program, or what discipline. And when I said I wanted to be a police officer, he just looked at me like I might as well said I wanted to be a Martian. It wasn't even an option. The RCMP were not accepting women at the time, neither were the, the OPP on paper were, but they never changed the height requirement or the weight requirement, and I was not five foot 10 and 160 pounds, and not likely to be that, so I just went to Queens. That was, uh, I didn't put down that I do have a BA and a Bachelor of Education uh, from Queens, and I just waited them out, because I was a closet feminist, and I wanted to have the career, and I wanted to have the money to do whatever I wanted to do, just like the guys, but I like guys, you know, don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, I just wanted, to, and the only way that a woman back then pretty well was going to make the same amount of money and have that kind of career track was to have a guy's job. So when the RCMP started accepting women, I was partway through my first degree, and uh, I was thrilled, but I, I finished my degree, threw in my application, and found out it takes about, usually takes about two years for the security clearance. Um, it took exactly one year, just enough time for me to get Bachelor of Education. Two weeks after I graduated from Queens with my Bachelor of Education, I was in Regina. Um, doors that were opened by, and I didn't really fully appreciate that that 1967 uh, Royal Commission on the Status of Women actually opened the door that led me into the RCMP. Bonnie, my academic friend, told me all about that at my book launch in 2007. And uh, so it's, it's really, it's, I just have benefited from the real feminists that did the, the work in the 60s. Um, the, uh, it, was, it was such an adventure, such an amazing opportunity. Who wouldn't want to try to do this? Especially, but to walk into a male occupation at that time, and it was so obviously a male occupation, and only the biggest and toughest guys were Mounties or police officers. And of, of all the police officers, the Mounties had the hardest road to haul because they had one man postings, and you, you do we enforce every law in Canada, any place in Canada, you do things abroad. I mean, it's just the biggest scope of things. And it was a pretty radical idea to think that a woman 
my size. And I think if you watched on the website, uh, that's my grad picture. I was actually 23, but I looked like I was 17. I weighed 115 pounds. Looked at least amount, like a Mountie, as you would expect. To think that somebody like myself could do that job was, was pretty radical. And to tell you the honest truth, I didn't have a clue whether I could do it either. Um, we were just making it up as we went along. And uh, it, was, it was a great adventure. I never regret it the day I joined, and I never regret it the day I left the RCMP. Um, it was just an amazing time. And so I got to watch this social revolution happening in front of me. And it was just, it was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. I had opportunities uh, thrust upon me that I hadn't yet earned, and there were times when I was subject to, uh, to uh, harassment that I didn't deserve. But it was just an amazing time. And, and a police force is no more than a reflection of society, and those are issues within society, and all things told. And I'm no apologist uh, one way or the other. I think that when the RCMP was acquiesced to the political pressures from the Royal Commission on the Status of Women and the Government of Canada to accept women, it turned everything on its head. But it not only turned it on its head, it turned power on its head, because women were second class. We, we were not in positions of authority normally. Um, there was this, we were the weaker sex, uh, mentally, physically, and emotionally, they believed. Um, a police officer has more power than the average citizen. So all of a sudden you gave a disadvantaged group more authority, and the, the majority of offenders still are male. So here you have women that are able to arrest and to take control of men. So on both a symbolic level for the RCMP, which is a symbol of Canada to adopt this gender equity, it was really a grand social experiment that was a, a privilege to be part of. But on an individual level, we saw those kind of uh, issues both internally and externally too. And, and that motivated me to write the book. Um, so um, that was, uh, that was the best thing about the RCMP was uh, the people that I worked with um, and the, the public that supports it and the country that we served. Um, probably the most surprising thing you might find about me is that this closet feminist, and I'm not a closet feminist anymore, I'm honestly a feminist, and, and I love to see that women and men are proud to say they're feminists now. I've been married for 33 years and I have four children, and how did that happen? I don't know, but it was great. Um, since the book was published, uh, and the reason that motivated me for the, uh, the book was, first of all, the privileged position of watching what was happening, but knowing that my children really had no idea how quickly we've moved in society, and also a, a deep-seated disappointment that the women's movement in the 1960s fell short. It didn't quite finish, and I wanted with the book to uh, open a dialogue, and it's done everything in spades. It's opened uh, avenues internationally uh, and domestically uh, to, to try and push it forward to finish, and it's a great time. Thank you. It's hard to follow. I did not prepare anything, so I'm just gonna wing it. Smile at you while I'm doing this. You'll be like, oh, that's good, I liked it. Uh, why did I join policing was the first question. Yes? Yeah, yeah. all right. Uh, when I was initially looking at some of the policing options, I too am from southern Ontario and a little bit of time change from when you were applying to when I was applying, but uh, certainly still the municipal forces there were very difficult to pass the physical tests and to get in. And I'm quite tall at five foot. I'm bringing a lot, lot with me to the table. So uh, I had a lot of struggles there, felt like, oh, I'm just not going to be able to break through. And was starting down a career of social work, but while social working, kept crossing paths with these police officers. And I don't know if it was a bit of a uniform fetish for these handsome young folks in uh, their well-cut hair and in the uniforms, but kept being drawn back to that. So eventually I did go and apply to the RCMP. It took several years to get in, quite a few attempts at the physical aspect of it, but once we finally got past that, figured that out, off I went. I would say the best part of being in the RCMP so far is opportunity. I'm um, married to a member. We have three kids and two grandkids. Look young for that, right? Good. Uh, we have, between collectively between the two of us, my husband and myself, we've had some very interesting opportunities to travel. And you, of course, you give up a little bit and, and your family sacrifices as well to, fam uh, to travel. 
But we, he is from Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. I'm from Ontario. Right now he's in Kiev, Ukraine, working on a training mission at their police academy. We've been able to go to four different provinces. We've worked in the north. He's worked in none of it. Just those opportunities of being able to travel around. My first posting was here in Powell River. Now, though it doesn't seem far when you're coming out of Toronto where there's a Tim Hortons on every corner and you're on your second ferry crying, going, why didn't I join Toronto PD? Where are we? But since then, I've learned all the benefits that we've had of seeing all over the world that we've been able to work. Um, something you don't know about me? Well, the last time I saw Irwin, yeah, that's one of them. The last time I crossed paths with Irwin, he quite literally walked in basically to a taser course we were teaching on and we almost had an opportunity to taser Irwin. But he passed on that opportunity. I, I think uh, the one thing, and kind of touches on the heels of what some of the other panelists have already spoken about, is I'm always looking for a way to make change, to make things better, to improve things. The area that I'm in, in the use of force world, especially at my size, is pretty not normal, right? I work with a lot of big burly boys that can throw a lot of people around, but being a use of force instructor and a firearms instructor, and I teach these guys how to instruct these other things, I'm hoping it's helping to break down some of those kind of in-house, not barriers per se, but perceptions of who does what roles, and hopefully I'm showing other members, both male and female, that it's not about being the biggest, toughest guy, right? It's about thinking smart, it's about tactics, it's about using your voice, so that's something I think uh, most people when they meet me don't think, oh, you're a carbine operator. That's nice. Yeah. Thanks. Should really be more, oh, you're a carbine operator. <laughs> Take a few steps back. So. To answer these questions, I put, I, I put about seven slides together. And the first one, uh, I guess what I would talk about a little bit is work-life balance. Uh, this picture is from when I had about three years of service. I was living in Port Moody and working in Coquitlam. And I was able to sneak home for a quick visit. That's my older son, who's now 16 and six foot three. Uh, ben, when he was about seven months old, and you can see my my German Shepherd Ranger in the front. And my point in showing you that photo was just to give you a start. How did I get into this job? I was working as a journalist in the Okanagan, working very closely with the local RCMP detachment. I had kind of thought about it when I graduated from high school, but hadn't really met anybody that could answer my questions. So I went into journalism where there's lots of variety and uh, the opportunity to work outside, do a bunch of different things every day. And when I started working with the local police force on issues that they were having as far as covering it as a journalist, I realized that what they were doing looked like a lot more fun than what I was doing. Even though I was enjoying my job, I could see how being a member of the RCMP was a really good fit for me, so I joined. And uh, my first day in Regina, just so you know, it was minus, six, minus 65 degrees. Think about that. Got to, wear, got to wear a really, really warm coat. So the next slide is just, uh, just to kind of take you on the path of my career. I spent eight and a half years in Coquitlam working in general duty, followed by, which is uniform, followed by school liaison, where I really started to see my passion that I liked working with youth. Uh, I particularly liked the fact that 95% of the youth that I dealt with, I never had to deal with again. There's a really low recidivism rate with youth offenders. Most youth offenders are about 3% of the population, so you can have a lot of success. Because I tried drug work, I tried other things, and you know when you're arresting a, a drug trafficker in his house and you spend 15 hours doing surveillance followed by 15 hours just collecting all the stuff out of his house, and by the time you're done, he's already been to court and is back out dealing again, wasn't for me. So I knew that that wasn't the area I wanted to go into. Uh, from the youth section, I went into sex crimes and, and focused predominantly on child abuse uh, cases, cases with youth sex offenders and then eventually went to the Missing Women's Task Force and spent some time working there on the Picton investigation. I had some knowledge of the family and uh, was invited to come and work there and worked with a lot of marginalized victims who uh, they really took that perspective that uh, we weren't treating victims and witnesses the way we should be and the laws subsequently changed to allow us to offer more to victims to take better care of them. So it was a pretty natural fit for me to move into the job. This picture's not fantastic. What I'm actually doing there is uh, putting a cell phone in a box. And the photographer took the picture from below. And if you actually go online, you can Google this and see a better copy of it. But uh, I left the Missing Women's Task Force to start and run 
uh, domestic violence unit at Richmond RCMP, one of the first of its kind in the province. And uh, we were definitely behind, behind the times because other provinces were already doing what we were trying to do. And one of the first initiatives I did was hold a community forum where I brought together 65 subject matter experts in domestic violence community people and ask them what they thought this unit should look like. And they wanted to form a group and start some projects, which became the Richmond Family Violence Pre Prevention Network. And the first project we did together was to uh, ask the public who had cell phones that they were no longer using to turn them into us so that we could give them to women in our transition houses so that they could dial 911 if they were out somewhere and were at risk. And what was really interesting about this program, this story ran in 2007 in the local papers, got some traction with some of our local media, they were interested in it. We received over 130 phones in the first two weeks. And even after I left Richmond Detachment in 2009, people still called or emailed me and asked where they could drop off their cell phones. It got a lot of traction and uh, we know that it helped a lot of women and our program was, was working. So the next slide is, if I remember, okay, I went to recruiting. I, I, to be honest with you, as much as domestic violence and gender-based violence is my passion, that's me and my buffalo, uh, I needed a break from it. It's very draining work when every person that you're dealing with decides at three o'clock in the afternoon that they and their children are coming to your office and need your help now. And I had young children and I was working on my master's degree and I'd just like to point out that both of my supervisors for my master's are in the room right now. So I'm a little nervous. This next picture, I went to recruiting for three and a half years as a team leader and I have to say it was probably one of my favorite experiences in the RCMP. I, I've always been an advocate for particularly women joining the RCMP. We did a number of events to encourage women to join. And this particular picture was taken when um, the initial complaints about harassment in the force came out. Uh, a national, I didn't know this at the time, I thought it was the Vancouver Sun wanted to talk to me about it, but it turns out that they, they syndicated it across the country. And the photographer showed up and I don't even like having my picture taken, but she spent a ton, bunch of time and as you can see, she liked the one with the buffalo there. That buffalo and I uh, became good friends that day, but my point in telling you about this is when I was asked about harassment in the RCMP, I had not been equipped with appropriate answers to, you know, nobody at national headquarters said, hey, tell them this. So all I simply said was this. There are people that are harassed in every job environment. It doesn't matter where you work. Any large organization has issues with harassment and, and problems in the workplace. But by the time I joined the force in 96, where the challenges really lay in that we have one in four women in the force, or one in, one in four officers are women. It's that way today. It, it doesn't matter that National wants 32% of the force to be women or 50% eventually. It's, it's a pipe dream because Census Canada tells us that only 20% of women want to be in law enforcement. That includes all law enforcement, not just the RCMP. We're at about 25%, which is about what we sit at and what we were at when I joined in 96. And what I found was the biggest challenge was to balance that the guys didn't get me any better than I got them. And they made a lot of mistakes. And as, as a woman who really could care less if you think I'm a BITCH, I would tell them that is just not appropriate. It may, I made some friends, I got some respect, and I made some enemies, but hey, I was okay with that. It was the women you see sitting at the other end of this table that allowed me to be in that position. So I really have to commend all three of you for the courage you had to do this and to get us where we got. So these next three pictures are fun. Uh, that first one was me sitting on a uh, iceberg. How many people here have sat on an iceberg? There you go, a couple people. One of the most amazing experiences I had in the force was the opportunity to go to Nunavut twice to do uh, relief work and wishing now that when I started in this career before I had children that I had done it at the start of my career because it was truly the most amazing experience. And when you talk about community policing and what the RCMP is supposed to be all about, that's what you're doing in a place like Nunavut. So that first picture was me on an iceberg. That was September, just so you know. Those icebergs had just rolled in, the polar bears were just starting to come. And no, I'm not wearing long underwear in that shot. So the next shot, I just threw a couple of these in so you could see the experience. I had a chance to go out with the Junior Rangers program, and just so you know, the Rangers program in the Arctic was brought into place to bring the uh, nomadic culture of uh, the Inuk people to communities so that they could maintain Canada's right to own the Arctic. 
So they trained all these rangers, and these are the junior rangers, a bunch of 15-year-old Inuk youth who go out a few times a year to learn how to do things like hunt. And I like to call this picture caribou kiss because the two girls hauled off and ate the eyeballs and kissed that caribou head right after they'd been hunting for it. So the last shot I threw in here, just so you know, these pictures weren't taken by me. I gave one of the kids my camera, and I think that is probably one of the most beautiful pictures I got out of the bunch. It's just an amazing shot of this girl who's about 11 years old, just having a great time, having a snack, and enjoying the minus 20 degree weather out in the middle of nowhere. And then I have one final shot for you. This is a shameless plug. We have a book coming out, uh, Red Coat Diaries, which uh, the first edition was stories of officers in the RCMP. The second edition is to honor 40 years of women in policing with 40 stories by women. All the stories are different. Uh, I, my story and why I showed you that first picture was from around the time that that picture was taken. So that's going to print in December and should be out in May if anybody's interested in having a look at it. If you you uh, can probably buy it through Amazon, but I promised uh, the editors I would put out a shameless plug for it. So thank you for, oh, oh, one thing you don't know about me? Do you want me to do that? Are you sure? Well, I have this thing about really cool socks. Like tonight, I'm wearing purple socks with uh, unicorns on them. I don't know if you can see those. You can see them later if you like. So a few years, when I was 42, I decided that roller derby was a really good idea. And it was a blast. And my, my roller derby name was Lucy Lawful, just so you know, because the socks were great. But unfortunately, I suffered a head injury in, uh, I can't remember now. I see that. No, I'm not joking. I actually, hold on, 2013, January of 2013. And as a result, I had to give up my, uh, that was one of the things I, my doctor basically said, uh, yeah, roller derby's out of the picture. So there you go. One thing you didn't know about me. Well, it's awesome. <laughs> um, I wonder if uh, you could each take a, a moment or two to talk about what advice you might give to a woman who uh, is considering a career as uh, either an RCMP or a police officer. Uh, I would say that um, you should be aware of the history uh, because the history um, tells you a lot about what you can expect today. Um, and I think that I would tell them to make sure you uh, understand that the work is not the only thing that you will be dealing with. Um, and then I would also say um, that you should know your human rights and know your workplace rights, and that is available to any of us online. I would say if you're going to be interested in the RCMP or in police work in general, I understand that it. it's a job where you're never bored. Um, that being said, I have to fess up that my youngest daughter is a fourth year criminology student, ex uh, University of Fraser Valley, now Simon Fraser, and um, I've encouraged her to keep her options open simply because shift work is really tough. Uh, some of the, uh, the, the surveillance units, uh, it, it's really tough. It's as tough for the guys too. This is, this is not a gender thing anymore. One of the impacts of women in the workforce in traditional male occupations are that uh, a lot of the men from the next generation have said, we don't want three XYs and kids that don't talk to us. So it's, it's, it's an extremely demanding job and you get to see the best, but you also get to see the worst in people. So um, make sure you, you research everything and keep all your options open. That's what I would say. What I tell my students, I teach uh, two or three classes at Kwantlen, and uh, part of what I do with them is, is show them the types of jobs that are available in criminal justice. So what I would say is broaden what you're thoughts are on what criminal justice or criminology is. Don't assume that just because you have a criminology degree, policing is the best fit for you. Look at all your options. Uh, from the point of view of being a woman who chose to join the RCMP, and only the RCMP, just so you know, I, I never looked at any other police force. It has been an amazing ride. Um, like Jennifer, I've had many opportunities to travel. When I did my research for my master's degree, I received funding to travel to London, to travel to the US, to do my research, and was supported by the people I worked with. So there are 150 jobs in the RCMP, 150 different jobs. Outside of the RCMP, and I'm not gonna talk about VPD, they, they don't have as much freedom, 
but they do have different jobs. It's just a different structure. It depends if you're willing to agree to go anywhere in Canada. If you're going to sign up with a police force, it's pretty important to be willing to do that and not assume you'll end up back in BC if that's what your desire is. I would say that look at corrections, look at customs, look at probation, look at criminal analysis, look at forensics. There's so many options out there for criminologists now that don't just stop the door at I gotta go to get a badge and get on the road. But if that is what you decide to do, go into it with an open mind and know that you do have to take care of yourself. My priority today, even though I work in a homicide unit and uh, teach on the side, is that 16-year-old that I told you about and, the thir and his 13-year-old bro brother, they are number one. And if you can learn to live that work-life balance, it can be an amazing career. You ready? Sure. Yeah, winging that again. Uh, Kind of like what Stephanie's saying too, I think one of the things, having worked at the academy in Regina, you see these new fresh recruits, and we're in a day and age where it's just like TV and movies, right? Well, that's what they do. Yeah, no, not at all. So in doing your research, like you've talked about, and seeing what you want to do, along with the 150 jobs, especially with the RCMP, because of the travel, something I would suggest to the new cadets is think about what kind of policing you want to do. Not necessarily what role, like what kind of policing. Do I want to work in a rural setting? Do I want to work up north, a small community? It, you're not guaranteed to come back to the lower mainland, so embrace that if you're going to go with the RCMP. There's no guarantees there. There'll be a lot less disappointment. But think about what type of policing you want to do, right? And it's not. I would echo what the, the other panelists have said. <clears throat> I, would, uh, I would add the part where, I think I'm learning this late in life. I'm learning a lot of things late in life. That's what family and grandchildren, first one, are teaching me. Um, I think what I did without even really realizing it was uh, I learned to scare myself every day. I'm using that word, it's a bit of hyperbole. But be prepared to be outside of your comfort zone every day. And um, think of it, so this is all about managing expectations, I think, of what is what you're hearing. Think of it as an opportunity to grow. And when you've just had the wits scared out of you and you're cool, like nobody knew that you were that scared. I've thought of going into rooms where there were guns and I've thought of being at the G20 on the front line and I've thought of lots of times that I've had the wits scared out of me. Once it was over, you could never take that away from me. Okay, I did that, and that helped me grow. So whatever you choose to do, yes, be very perceptive about um, choosing the career, but know yourself. And um, it might not be, it might be what people around you think you're good at, but you're the only one who can know in your heart what you can do, really do. Because you wouldn't want to let people down either. Put yourself in a situation where somebody else is at risk. So it's finding that sweet spot with your family and in your heart about why you're doing what you're doing. Bonnie, if I can ask you a question. You spoke in your introduction about uh, the contributions of women. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about how you see the contributions that women have made to the culture of the RCMP. Well, um, I think in, during the course of my research, the, the one thing that um, I came to understand in a very big way, and it, was a, it ended up being a major theme in, in all of my work, um, was that women brought alternative perspectives to the RCMP. Um, as I mentioned, you know, in the, especially in the 70s and 80s, you had to be big and burly and, and strong and uh, willing to handle yourself in physical um, confrontations. And women, um, especially the women I interviewed, all of them, without exception, I interviewed 45 people, um, without exception, every one of the women said that their greatest strength was their ability to negotiate. And that was not accepted in the 1970s or even the 80s. I, I believe it's changed now just based on what I've been hearing from the other panelists, which is so encouraging, by the way. Uh, so I, I would say that um, uh, the culture has changed in that, that regard. And um, I think that is just an example of um, uh, 
women just sticking to it and, and continuing to do the work um, as uh, they feel they should and not to be so um, engaged in the male standard of policing but to accept the reality that um, they have so much to contribute from an alternative perspective. Jane, <laughs> uh, given the subject matter of your book and uh, the structure of it, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about your sense of what the reaction from the police have been to your book. Actually, I was really quite worried because it, it was the first book that was published about the, uh, uh, the female experience within the RCMP. Um, and uh, actually, writing it was, uh, was very enjoyable and it was very important and, and I thought my children should know about it. Um, but I, I was a little worried uh, about actually going, getting it published, but then I was kind of consoled myself with the fact that the chances of an unknown author uh, with an unsolicited manuscript getting a publisher was next to nothing. And when I um, submitted it to the first publisher and he came back and said, we'll publish your book, and then somehow it ended up with a second publisher, I thought, we've either done something really stupid or, or hopefully something good, but I didn't know if the RCMP would, how they would take it. Um, because it was, I did my, I did my best to give the information the way I had been trained as an RCMP officer, did the observations and let the readers draw their own conclusions. It's not for me to, to, to tell people what to think. It's just that's what a police officer does is, is give the information to people. And, um, and the reaction from the organization has been nothing. But I was a little concerned. My husband was still in the force. <laughs> And, I, and when I did realize it was going to be published, I, I, I said to him, you know, and he was a staff sergeant at the time, I said, you know, um, if this gets published, just so you know, you, you might want to make sure you're comfortable at the rank you're at. And he turned around and he said, if I belong to an organization where that would have any effect, then I don't want to belong to the organization. And after the book was published and totally unrelated, he did make commissioned officers, so it didn't affect him at all. The RCMP, uh, the veterans were just amazing. They, uh, they fully supported it. And so many women and it, and have come to me to sign the book as they go off to depot, and it was not a recruitment tool. Um, I called up the good and the bad in the force. So um, I, was, I was, first of all, surprised with the lack of response from the organization and really pleased with the response from the people within and retired from the force and going into the force. So um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a pleasant surprise. I was worried about nothing. Well, it's, it's interesting that in terms of the panel, we sort of have some pioneers of women in policing and then sort of the next generation. Given, Jennifer, given your experience at Depo, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the degree to which there are any distinct challenges in recruiting and retaining female members. And then if you could speak to, are there any differences in today's female recruits versus the type of female recruits you might receive 10 years ago? Yeah, I can, um, our training academy programs have grown extensively. They're very um, proactive. The one thing that I would say, and this is just my personal opinion, not the views of the RCMP, is that we are still teaching a big white guy program in many ways. So we're growing ahead with technology and uh, other things. And I think that we need to start looking at um, a little bit more, to a degree, of a student-centered approach, in a way. Hard to do in a total institutional kind of program like that, right, where there's a certain standard to be met. The, given the fact that there is physical standards, just inherently, genetically, how we're put together, you will see, there are notably more female injuries, um, more female failures on some of the physical related benchmarks like shooting, which takes a great deal of hand strength and the pair, just on what it is, right? So, but I also appreciate that there are certain standards there because without a minimum standard, and you can speak to that even with recruiting, right? Without some sort of minimum standard. So I would say that, um, I can say anecdotally, like at firearms that two thirds of our remedial shooters were female. I think there's a lot of other reasons that could contribute to that, right? Whether it's the staff hopefully not turning the uh, temperature down again to create more of an audience there, but there's a lot of other factors that play into that. But I think it's more the physical side. The second side is I went through depot when my daughter was three years old. Very challenging. 
I see just as many male uh, cadets with families, wives, mortgages, kids at home, but still culturally, traditionally, it seems to be somewhat more taxing on many of our female cadets that have a family or kids at home than males. So I find that when they're stressed or some setbacks happen, they're probably likely to go back to the fold, just without the statistics, just what I observed when I was there. Just from the recruiting angle, we did some research into fairly simple research in that we started to look at what type of woman actually applies to become a member of the RCMP or applies to become a police officer and what are the barriers to them even attending a career presentation and hearing what their opportunities are. And one of the biggest barriers we actually found was the idea of carrying a gun. And there's a, there's, so some of those factors are exactly what we've talked about already, which is the fear that they won't be successful with it. And some of those factors are just the idea of shooting somebody. But believe it or not, there is a certain portion of the male population then that when asked if they would be capable of shooting someone said no. And then you have to ask them, are you sure this is the right career for you because you are going to be carrying a firearm? Because again, that TV side of things plays into it. They've been watching too much CSI and are they sees a bunch of people walking around with toothpicks and listening to the who will they solve DNA puzzles in an hour? Not possible. It, so we, we really looked at that and said, what could we do to change the recruiting program to encourage women who may be on the fence about whether this is the right career for them to come forward and at least attend a career presentation, find out more about it and see if maybe there was a way that it would work for them. And so what we've done now and what they continue to do is support all applicants, not just women, but it was initially geared towards women, with pair practice sessions, uh, firearms orientations, extra training opportunities before they ever engage at depot to find out, first of all, is it the right career for me? And second of all, am I capable of doing these things and I didn't really know if I was? So it's just that opportunity is being made more available and it's that learning-centric model that we've just been talking about. Oh, pair, anybody? Anybody, who wants to guess what it is? Anybody want to run the pair? <laughs> police Athletic Response Evaluation. It is the physical test that all uh, officers in the RCMP must pass uh, at four minutes by the time they graduate from depot, 4.45 to actually be accepted to go to depot. If you're interested in seeing more, you just if you just Google pair, P-A-R-E, you can watch everything from a guy do it in two minutes and 17 seconds, which is the record to just people, every, for some reason, people like to record themselves running it. And, and, uh, it's, and just to explain what it is, it's a fight or flight test. It's designed to mimic the types of activities you would engage in while working as a uniformed police officer, where you uh, initially you are chasing a bad guy. Oh, sorry, bad guy. There's more bad guys than there are bad girls, so I'm going to be bad person. You're chasing someone. You catch them. You have a tussle with them. And then for some strange reason, you have to carry their torso for about 50 meters at the end. It's just to show that you're capable of rescuing someone and carrying them out of a situation or, or getting them out of there. So that's what the test is supposed to mimic, what it's really like to do the job. And that's actually something, it's, it, because it's a fight or flight test, it's really nerve wracking. There is not a member of the RCMP that enjoys taking the test, except for maybe the IRC guys, because they run it every week. It's not pleasant. It's designed to take you into your upper heart rate range, so not at a comfortable, I'm going for a jog and getting some exercise range. It's supposed to take you quite a bit above that, and you're supposed to stay there for four minutes. So by the time you're done, you're pretty much spent. Does that answer that question? Oh, and yeah, oh, yeah actually, Jennifer just pointed out, the test standard is uh, non-gender specific. So what you'll see is, uh, and, and I can tell you, it's funny sitting here at this table because I used to see the applications working in recruiting for three and a half years doing suitability and proactive recruiting. I saw a lot of women's applications. The quality of women signing up for the career presentations, the tests, going through the process is by far higher than, this, than men in the same age group. Degrees, previous jobs, very little criminality. So the quality of women that actually come forward, the type of women that, that choose this as a career, are amazing. And that consistently, I saw that across the board. But 
some of the limitations that we have related to our, our gender have to be overcome without trying to be as good as the men around you for what it's worth and what, what we're talking about here with those injuries. You have to find a way to be as healthy as you can be and not have that type of thing get in your way. Um, Margaret, uh, given the, the amount of time you, you've got to spend in policing and the vast experiences you've had, I wonder if you could speak a little bit about uh, what area or areas you feel still need the most change when it comes to the role, responsibility, or treatment of women in your city? Well, my immediate reaction is, um, interestingly, non-gender specific, except for the part where um, leadership, so the women that were bringing in, the women that came in behind me, the women that led me, that I worked for, who were very few at the time, um, we need to get those perspectives, whether it's female or at least um, gender and diversity aware, uh, in the higher ranks. So we need women to bring, to be role models, to be examples, to, to do what I hear happening here, get this information out so that young women can hear it and see it and see that it's real and that you're flesh and blood people and you're not off TV and um, this is the real deal. I mean, I was young once too. Um, and I remember all those fears and I remember one of the most significant things for me when, was having a female supervisor, superintendent at the Olympics. Um, I had an issue up in Whistler and she was phenomenal. And when I thanked her, she, it actually took her back. So it taught me too that um, even the women in those positions need to be supported. Whether they look like they're all powerful, they're human. They've got families at home, they got promoted up through the ranks, but they were there, and now they are in rarefied atmosphere as well. So it's leadership uh, across, leadership down, and leadership up. Does that make sense? If, before you ask your question, I just have to tell you that, um, getting back to the fire, firearms range, um, the instructors in the 1970s uh, were getting quite creative with the first women who went through they weren't just looking at my nipples because they taught me how to fire a revolver with my second finger because my index finger was too short to uh, accurately squeeze the trigger. And so I did uh, qualify marksmanship. <laughs> and yes, but they weren't, assured, they weren't too sure whether or not I would make it just because I was having trouble squeezing the, the trigger. Uh, so that falls into the category of something that you don't know about me. <laughs> And we've been talking a lot about the sort of the police's uh, attitudes and the changing attitudes around the introduction of women into the RCMP and some of the challenges that uh, women faced. I wonder, Jane, if you could speak a little bit about your sense of how the public felt about having uniformed police officers, female police officers. Yeah, it was a, it was that's a good question. Um, it was it was uh, it was really amazing. You go to depot for six months and uh, you're in the depot experience. You're, it's wonderful. Everybody's in uniform. Everybody knows who you are. And uh, then I was posted out to North Vancouver, and I was actually the, the fifth female police officer in North Vancouver because the superintendent in charge of North Vancouver decided it would be, he was really progressive, and he thought, well, well let's have one on each watch. So it wasn't like I was the first one in North Vancouver. Um, I was in the first two and a half years of women being accepted into the force because I was awaiting them out at university. I went, uh, I realized quite quickly that uh, if I was, Prepared in the first first six months after depo, you're uh, you're on the book, and you're with an experienced police officer, and uh, you're standing beside the six foot two guy with the mustache. You're, you're put, they were might as well have been all cookie cutter. I mean, they were all good looking. They were all in their twenties. They all had the mustache, and uh, they didn't even see me, and and that was fine because I was right out of depo, and I'm just learning. So like, but after the first couple of weeks, the guy I was with realized that, you know, I'm just, they're not even, they didn't even register, weren't talking to me, so it was just a routine inquiry um, at a bungalow in North Vancouver, and uh, so as we walk up the sidewalk, he says, okay, you're gonna do all the talking this time, and as he knocked on the door, he stepped to the side, so that when the homeowner opened the door, all they saw was me, 
in uniform with a gun on and even a hat because I was a recruit and I had to wear that silly thing that's back there. Um, the homeowner, an elderly lady, opens the door, takes one look at me and looks over her shoulder to her husband on the couch and said, dear, the girl guides are here. <laughs> And Chris Bomford starts to laugh, and then she kind of looks out, and she sees this great big bounty. And then she looks at me, and she looks at the police car, and she looks, and she says, "You're not the girl guides." And at this point, he rolls right into the flower bed, and he's rolling around laughing. And here comes the husband with the two dollars for the cookies, and uh, <laughs> and I begged Chris not to tell that story when we got back to the attachment, but you can guess um, how that went. That wasn't, you know, it was people did not know who I was and uh, it and actually it's probably one of the reasons I ended up in in a, a plain clothes rotation pretty quickly because they thought wow if she can drive around in a police car in a full uniform and they can't figure out she's a Mountie you know let's let's put her on a little bit of surveillance and undercover <laughs> so those are those were some of the opportunities they may not have earned yet but really helped me develop as a member very early but yeah the, the public reaction was extremely positive I can only think of one impaired driver um, who was really um, not in a very good frame of mind because he had just found his girlfriend cheating on him in a bar. And when he confronted her, her new boyfriend punched him out. And uh, I caught him flying down Marine Drive, and he was, he was really mad at women. And, uh, and uh, I really thought we would, uh, that would end up with a dance, but I somehow got him into the back without a fight, and he refused. And, and, Anybody, any police officer knows that impaired driving is a lot harder charge to prove than impaired, impaired, or a refusal, because as long as you have the grounds to read the demand, I mean, it's a slam dunk. So on the stand, um, the, um, the, uh, the defense lawyer asked him, he says, isn't it right that, uh, um, no, it wasn't him, it was the, the breathalyzer operator. Isn't it right that he, because he had to refuse in front of the breathalyzer operator, um, isn't it right that the reason my client refused was because he hadn't contacted his lawyer yet and he was waiting for his lawyer and the breathalyzer operator said no. He said that he did not believe that women had the right to demand anything of men. And at that point the, his lawyer said, your honor it was not me <laughs> and the judge said I hope it wasn't <laughs> but, and he was guilty. <laughs> well I feel, I feel very fortunate that I've had this opportunity to ask uh, this question so maybe at this point I'll introduce Dr. Amy Prevost uh, who can then turn it over to have you be given the opportunity to ask uh, questions that you would like of our panel. Do you want me to go through the rules quickly? Sure. Sure. Three quick rules when you think about your questions. Please a question, not a statement. Um, try to keep it to 30 seconds or less. And even though I violated the rule, there's no such thing as a two-part question. If that's two questions, just pick the better one and ask that one. Okay? And then this is Dr. Amy Prevost. And, uh, hey. Hello, ladies. It sounds like it's been a great event so far. Sorry I was a little bit late. But good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to be here tonight. I'm so happy that I was able to join in on the last part of this exciting conversation and uh, most importantly, to celebrate the success of U of e alumni. So this is a fantastic event, and I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, I think now we will move into the question and answer period. So I will open up to the floor. And as everyone said, a couple rules. But uh, Please ask your question, direct it to the panelists if you wish, and uh, if you don't have any questions, I have my own, but hopefully you have some, so it's all yours. Oh, that was easy. Yes, go ahead. Um, I, I really appreciate the panel. It's just a fantastic uh, range of experience and background. But my question is this, um, from your position, as leaders in law enforcement, are there easy observations or recommendations you make in terms of improving the law that would allow us to do a better job? Like, sometimes I get the impression, I'm not making a statement, <laughs> that the legal industry has such a deep vested interest in running the show that it's, it's, it's a bit like what you said, Stephanie. You, you lock somebody up who's a drug dealer and they're out dealing drugs within a matter of two hours. And I think the public perception is, wait a sec, who's, who's running the show here? Any, is there any low hanging fruit here where we could be innovative and work together to improve this so we get more bad people off the streets? 
I'll start by saying we live in Canada where we have the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And I'll tell you the same thing I tell my students because after 19 years of doing this, you think I would be at the point where um, I'd be sliding down that slippery slope and saying, what rules do I need to break to achieve this? And that's something that has happened to police officers. We continue to use innovative techniques to try to stay ahead of what the criminals are doing. And, and in particular, in the area I'm working in now, they do some amazing things to be able to achieve criminal charges against some of the worst people in our communities. But that Charter of Rights protects our offenders as much as it protects us. And what I'd like to say is, are we willing to give up that balance that we have our rights by changing our laws to take away the rights from others? And we're in the middle of that right now. Bill C-51 is an excellent example of a piece of legislation that, um, for all of you young people sitting in the room, you could be stopped by a police officer and checked simply because you've been doing a project on ISIS and you happen to be wearing a backpack. It's as simple as that. So. Am I willing to give up my rights to allow that kind of legislation or law take, take effect? No. What I am willing to do and what I have done in my uh, work around domestic violence, because again, it's a passion for me, is I'm not willing to accept no as an answer. I'm a problem solver. You told me no, I can't do it that way, so let me find a way that I can, that I can do legally, morally, ethically, and appropriately that ser serves all of those purposes. And I think what I would say is you're sitting here staring at a table of women who have done that throughout their careers. I'm not the only one that has had to become innovative. And as an organization, we've had to become innovative. But it all comes down to, I truly believe, black and white, we need to protect the Charter of Rights and allow people to have their rights, whether they're breaking the law or not. And because of that, there's some give and take we don't want to take too much because then we're living in an authoritarian society. We need to give a little bit and understand that maybe we need to work on fixing some of these problems. Uh, putting some money into corrections and, and uh, rehabilitation that rather than just throwing people in jail. So there's, there's a whole bunch of things we need to do, not just, the laws are not bad. We do change laws like the laws around uh, child exploitation and sexually exploited youth. We've made huge strides in how we manage those laws as a result of technology and innovation. It's just a balancing act and, and you know, it's a slow moving bus, but overall, uh, we've got it pretty good. I, I really do think so. I'm, I, I don't get frustrated even with the drug dealers because we should be looking at why they're doing it, not how do we stop them. If we look at why they're doing it, maybe we can change the behavior in 90% of them. I'm naively optimistic, even after 19 years. Uh, absolutely, I echo what she says. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to go back. I'm not going to point anybody in the room out, but a young lady before this session tonight asked me, we were talking about her future career plans, and um, she's interested in the program Criminal Mind. And um, in her, she's thinking about policing as a career. And. Um, my, my response to her was, that's the key, uh, criminal mind. So that as a police officer, we, yes, absolutely, we work with criminals. Yes, you charge people and that kind of stuff. The day-to-day -day bread and butter are people who have just had not had the luck that I have in my life. Um, bad decisions, no education, no supports, um, uh, cycles of violence in their families they don't know how to break, and on and on. Um, I've all, often heard myself say, if we took away alcohol, half the force would be out of a job. These are not criminals, okay? So there's a lot we can do to help people not get into circumstances that require police attendance. So in, in sort of what Stephanie is saying, um, thinking about what a criminal really is and our perceptions about that, and maybe cutting back on the media consumption. <laughs> Well, thank you for your question, and thank you, Stephanie and Margaret. Any further questions from the floor? Can I ask a question? Of course. Less than 30 seconds and only one question. <laughs> I'm curious, and, I, and any one of you can answer it, uh, particularly uh, some of the younger women here that may be thinking about this as a career, is what led to you coming here tonight? So I'll leave it to you guys. Whoever feels comfortable, stand up and answer the question for us. 
You can ask? Okay, go for it. Sophie. Sophie's going to tell us the answer. I met her earlier. Personal experience, what are you doing here? So, yeah, like as I was saying two years ago, I went to Regina and I got the chance to meet some Mounties at, um, what do you call, Depot. Um, and so I just thought that was really cool. And I saw the parade and I went to the museum. And so that just kind of sparked an interest in me because I've always been kind of interested in law enforcement. I'm the girl that she was talking about. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, um, it was just really a neat experience. And so that's why I came here tonight because my dad works here and he's like, oh, Sophie, we should go here. And because I know you like this stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm here. So, yeah, okay. Any further questions? We have some. Okay. Maybe would you like them? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, when? What are the obstacles? The work that I think um, the work that I think I think Jane or Bonnie said that the work that's not finished. What is that work that has to be done? That's it. If you're a betting woman, I'll get, I'll take a bet and tell you who I think the next commissioner is going to be. Go for you know it. No, nope, she's coming out of headquarters. Really? What does it take? Her name. What are you saying? That is, it's going to be Janice Armstrong. Absolutely, Janice Armstrong. And for those of you who know who she is, she was the media relations officer in Surrey for a long time. In charge of language. Years ago, and then in charge of language. But I will put my money that Janice Armstrong will be the next commissioner. Why? Why? <laughs> Answer why? Do you want to just want to? Okay. okay. She has the right combination of political skill combined with respect and authority to take us to that next stage. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talking the talk, but until we actually put that person in place who can put the whole package together, which she's very good at doing, uh, she has a great deal of respect from all members of the RCMP, much like Bev Busson did when she was the commissioner. So I, I really, you know, if I was looking at who's there right now, and there are a lot of women in those very high roles, she would be my, my, my pick for uh, the next pony in this race. I'm a big fan of Janice, and uh, I agree. I put my bet on that. Uh, but I would caution that uh, just simply having a female commissioner, we've had one before, an excellent one, Bev Vassan, um, doesn't mean that all of a sudden there's gender equality. Um, hopefully, Janet, um, if she gets that position, or whoever does, male or female, amasses a very good team, a diverse team that can look outside as well as inside, that understands the culture, or maybe some have stepped back far enough to understand its weaknesses. And uh, it's going to end up being a leadership uh, position. So don't just think because all of a sudden a female takes over a CEO or the, everything's going to be right. As a matter of fact, sometimes there can be backlashes. So um, yeah, so male or female, as long as that person is the right leader that can amass that pool of diverse talent to draw on, um, that's going to serve the organization very well. Okay. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering, I, I too am about five foot, so when it comes to training, like physically, um, what, like, how did you do it? Like, what, was running really helpful? I did it wrong for a long time, <laughs> right? So it's um, part of the physical level, especially like in the training academy, is learning how to deal with stress too. Right? It's time management, it's dealing with the stress, it's dealing with the pressures. Because when that's weighing and running heavy all the time, that's very exhausting, right? Then I also learned that I don't necessarily need to go and do the same judo move that my partner does. So I learned to talk really well to people on unbelievable outcomes like you've had before. Like, oh, can I give you a hug? Yeah, let me just open the back door of the car, get in there. Yeah, yeah, okay, good. Right? So it's, it's a lot to do with approach. You still have to be physically 
prepared. The one thing I will say at recruiting sessions that I've been at when people are like, so what exercises should I do to run better? Hmm. Run. If I advocate anything, start running, start doing push-ups. Because you're going to do a whole bunch of them if you go there, right? And that's the best way to get ready for it. But it's also that stress relief, right? Of finding that time, scheduling it in. That helps. Thank you, that was a good question. Thanks, Jennifer, for the response. Further questions? Yes. As someone who's been considering academic policing for quite a few years, and I haven't quite decided on it yet, um, I am graduating soon, so is there anything that you can recommend that I do that can help me make that decision, like any next steps that I should take? Mm -hmm. I, I don't need the microphone. <laughs> As I said, one of my supervisors is sitting at the back. He can hear me without the microphone, too. Um, first thing I'm going to suggest to you right now is if you've never been to a career presentation, go to one. Because you'll find out what the steps are. The RCMP website, the Vancouver Police website, they're all really, really succinct in the information that they provide. Um, for someone who is concerned about size being a factor, and even for someone who's not but just wants to understand the physicality of what it takes to run the police athletic response evaluation, and to get some guidance and direction from our fitness and lifestyle experts who are there. If you go onto the RCMP site, once a month they offer a three hour pair training session. You can sign up for it. You're not actually allowed to run the whole course, but you are allowed to run the stages, try out the equipment. Um, the machine that we use now to show that part where I talked about the struggle now goes up and down based on your size, which when, when we went through, yeah. you actually had to do it, everybody at the same height, at the same size, and it was really designed more for a man about 5'11 um, with long arms. Yeah, so now you can move the machine up and down. So there's, they've understood that you're not going to struggle with somebody the same way a 5'11 man does. So you need to be able to struggle with them the way you're going to struggle with them. But I really recommend having a look at the sites because there's lots of information on the process, the amount of time it takes. If you want to get in this week, I suggest you go municipal because the reason the RCMP takes longer, people always say, why? Why does it take so long? We have to give you a top secret clearance in order to be part of the federal police force. It takes up to 12 weeks to complete the tail end of that process. There's no slowing it down. There's no changing it. If you've traveled extensively, it can sometimes be longer. But it means that you have the security clearance you need. A police officer coming over to the RCMP from a municipal force still has to go through that same process. They don't have the same security clearance. So don't get frustrated. Go to a career presentation of your choice. It doesn't matter which one. I, I'm an advocate for the RCMP because obviously I believe in it, but I do understand that it's not the best fit for everyone. If you're sitting here saying, I'm not willing to sign a piece of paper that says I'll go anywhere in Canada and I really don't want to spend six months in Regina, it's beautiful. <laughs> beautiful. Actually, it is beautiful there. Um, and and you just, all I can say is I used to, I, I taught D.A.R.E. for a number of years, drug abuse resistance education to kids. And I would ask them a question, and I'll see if anybody can get it in this room. You've seen us in our uniforms. You've seen us with all those tools on our tool belt, tasers and guns and carbines and pepper spray and batons. But can anybody here tell me what you think the number one tool I use in my job every day is? The brain is part of it, but what's the actual tool that I'm using? What am I using to deal with situations? Communication. I, I don't know how many times I can say that, that the women I know in the force are far better at bringing that situation back down to a calm level than a lot of the men who immediately, because it's man on man most of the time, it's a testosterone thing and it gets out of hand. So you learn how to be a great talker and, because I don't like to fight. I fought, I've got the injuries to prove it, but if I'm fighting you, you're gonna get hurt really bad and I'm still gonna get hurt even if I don't wanna get hurt because you always get hurt. So it's learning how to talk to people. I'm gonna ask you why you're waffling. No pressure. <laughs> um, on the question of how to come down here, is John paying the student? I think I'm the one that said scare yourself every day. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm probably one of the people that just sort of wandered into this naive. I was lucky enough to be 5'9", and which I didn't have a lot of weight, but it helped. Um, but you know what, it's like anything, unless somebody is 
I don't know, unless your car is going over a cliff or unless somebody's just burst into the room and, and threatening your life, most decisions you have time to think about or adapt to. Most situations you have time to adapt to. You're not going to be a, a Mountie tomorrow. It's going to take a long time. You're going to go through the whole process. And as Steph referred to the pair test, familiarization with the equipment's half the deal. If you lift weights in a gym, I was, for a long time, I was intimidated about going into a gym for any number of reasons. But uh, once I got familiar with the equipment and I could look like I knew what I was doing, and then I did know what I was doing, it took away a lot of that. Then I could ignore everybody else because I knew what I was doing. That's how it starts. Nobody expects you to be able to do it by the time you arrive. And then when you leave, there's always a safety net. Nobody's going to let you go out there and get hurt, get them hurt. You're going to get training in the field. You're going to have to, you know, and you'll get feedback, lots of it. So if you're not fit for the job, what's the worst that can happen? You had a chance at it. You saw it. You learned a lot of stuff. You said, this doesn't work for me. That's probably good for you and for the organization if it's not right. But you won't know until you try it, right? And I just want to add a little story. I am five foot one, and I remember during my training, uh, we were taking a, a ground fighting class, and they brought in the senior male troop to fight with us because half of our troop were female, and most of us were just a little bit bigger than me. And um, I remember this one guy, he came up to me, and he looked at me, and he looked me up and down, and he said, yeah, right. And of course, he, he was right. He just flipped me over. and had me pinned down, and all I could think of to do was to apply a horse bite. And a horse bite is just grab the fleshy part of an arm or the inside of a thigh. And the only thing I could move was my hand, and I managed to get my arm free, and I was going to reach around and give him a horse bite on his thigh. But of course, he thought I was going for other regions. He let me go quicker than you can ever shake a stick at. And he just stood up, and he looked at me, and he yelled, and he went, no, I know what you're going to do. <laughs> You let me go. <laughs> Thank you for the question and some really great advice there. So I don't know how we are for time. Let's... Okay, do we have any other questions? Yes. Um, sounds like all of you guys have like families and kids and stuff. So how did you juggle that? Like, you want to have family and future. How did that work? Like with shift work, especially like your husband. That's an excellent question. That was actually the question I was going to ask. So, no, no, it's a, it's a great. I probably question. got the I most kids. kids so. <laughs> I probably have the most children. I have four, and at baby number three, um, we got to live in nanny. Uh, we pretty much had to. When I got married, it really wasn't. Uh, we had decided we'd have children, but I kind of dragged my feet. And um, um, after the first one, I was into it, and. Um, we, we, we had, yeah, we, well, and cheaper by the dozen, you might as well, anyway. Um, shift work is really demanding, but the nice thing about 12-hour shift is it's two days, two nights, and you got four off. And uh, both my husband and I were in plain clothes um, when we had our first, actually, I was in plain clothes, which was Monday to Friday. He was in on 12-hour shifts, so the babysitting was at a minimum, and it was a next-door neighbor. And that worked with baby number two. And by the time baby number three came, I said two things. I want a nanny because he was going to plain clothes, and I decided to come out of plain clothes and into uh, uniform because I like two days too, too off. So, but it, it's no different than any other occupation where you have a husband and wife working. Um, the, with the shift work, you can actually share the parenting and have more parent around at a time for your children. You can look at it that way. And this new generation of men uh, and women are expecting that and doing that. And I'm so impressed because my generation, definitely child rearing was still the woman's responsibility. So. Um, you have to you have to look at it all the way around and uh, if you it, I, I was jealous of my husband working the shift when I was working Monday to Friday and commuting into headquarters because he had more time with the children and that's why I asked to go back to shift work um, and it just coincided so anybody else 
think there's a lot of opportunities too. I know when my husband and I were both posted in a small town together, that I had some crotchety old bosses that were like, oh, Doug, you gotta put the kids on the bus. You come in at nine, you, you be here for six, <laughs> right, kind of thing. But uh, in a smaller settings, a lot of places we work are very small, right, outside of Lower Mainland. In a community-based setting like that, there's a lot of, uh, not freedom, but ability to flex, right? So I could be the crossing guard liaison, but drive all my kids to school some differences like that. And the bigger centers down here, there are so many different opportunities and different shifts you can work in. Irwin, thanks to you, we now have Echo Watch happening in Surrey where the uh, permanent weekends, they've, they've set up watches for a variety of other reasons, but for our membership, to know that you're only gonna work these four days, it's full of gentlemen whose wives all work day shifts or works, there's a lot of options out there to flex back and forth. And I know in our household, the goal was that when somebody was pursuing a new work opportunity, when I was going to IDENT, he left the road and went to traffic so he could be home at night so I could be called out. So we give and take too, right? There's a little of that. I'm mostly in charge though, mostly. He's not here, so I can say that. And um, it's, it's very challenging for single mothers or single fathers as well too, though the shift work, I will tell you that. It's hard to get a daycare uh, situation that goes overnight, so that, that's, that's a, a different situation than I had or, or you had. On Bonnie's behalf, I'll throw a little bit of history in there. <clears throat> it's interesting that you're asking the question because from, from my perspective, things are a whole lot easier and better now than they were. And not just because of the policies and procedures, but the culture has shifted. And I'll give you an example. When I had my, my children, there was six month maternity leave. That's a year now, but nobody would think of asking you to come back at six months. They shouldn't have asked me. My brain was still awash with the breastfeeding and all this stuff. Um, and it, that was relatively new. And now, when I left the force a couple of years ago, paternity leave, doesn't matter, paternity, paternity, parental leave. It's all about language. So it's parental leave, and when they began calling it parental leave, when I was in Richmond, there were more men on um, paternity leave at the time than there were women. And whether it's a two-career marriage or a member that's married to somebody else, they needed that time up, and they wanted to be home with their children. This is, this is, and men in my time might have liked to have been home with their children, but they never would have said so because it just simply wasn't cool, wasn't appropriate, wasn't manly. Now it's a right and I want it, you know, and you're gonna get it because it's, it's, it's the way it is. So really there's the, my friends here are absolutely right. You've got lots of options now and it's culturally and socially acceptable. Thank you. If, if I could just follow up quickly to that, uh, to the challenges of the work-life balance, how do you think that impacts women's decisions to compete for senior management positions within the organization? Sorry, I gotta answer this one. <laughs> I wrote a white paper way back after, a year after the book was published. I was invited to as a, an international think tank, and I don't know how I got there, but I married an academic, uh, everyone knows him, uh, and, uh, and I presented that, and because I was wondering that too, because we're not proportionally represented at the executive level. And it was the first time that I ever read feminist theory, because back in the 70s, we didn't have feminism as a course at Queens anyway. I, maybe they had it at other universities. And I looked, and I, I got data from straight across Canada, different police forces that broke down gender, not just by the, the amount in, but by rank as well. And there it was staring you in the face. And I, and I wondered if people, women were more likely to opt out. Um, from asking that question at that international panel, um, all of a sudden I was the chair of the Women in Leadership under Police Futures International with 20 different people from around the world. Almost everybody had a PhD except for me. And uh, I, I tell you the honest truth, I've never even been on a committee because I'm just pretty singular and here I am a chair. I didn't know what I was doing. But we, we looked at this for five years, hugely smart people. This is, a, this is a, an issue that is much bigger than any one police force. And, uh, and men and women, one third is, uh, were men. And one of the things we did was we developed a research project on that. 
And uh, the research project was international, two uh, Canadian police forces, two American police forces. Uh, we surveyed about 1,300. I gave a copy by email to Irwin. Anybody that would like to uh, have a look at the research, um, it was dual parted. We partnered with Myers Brig. That was the first part. The second part, which was what I was after, because I'm the non academic, was a simple questionnaire asking, Are you actively seeking promotion? And uh, if not, why not? So it was looking at barriers as well, too. And we can say categorically from that simple, direct question, because nobody's actually, everybody's made that assumption. I've heard politicians say it as well, too. Everybody thinks that's why there's, a, there's, an, there's an imbalance in the power. Men and women, apples to apples, are seeking promotion on the same level. The same percentage of women want the same promotion the men's do. So something else is going on. And I'm really, really proud to have been part of that. Uh, it was spearheaded by uh, um, um, Cloud State University, uh, Stephen Hennessy. Um, and uh, we've got so much raw data, we're just boiling down through it. But it asks a simple question, and so it's not a gender thing. So there are other issues um, that need to be looked at, and uh, we're just digging down. So. I, I'd just like to debunk that myth because we have the study. Thank you very much. Well, I think that wraps up the formal part of the event. I'm going to pass it back to Whitney for closing remarks. Thank you very much, and thanks for the questions. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Whitney Fordham, and I'm the manager of alumni relations here at UFE. And uh, on behalf of the UFE Alumni Association, I just wanted to take a moment to thank our panelists and also our faculty hosts. And so we've got a little gift for them. And it's no secret, it is our alumni commemorative wine, which is available for purchase. And um, all proceeds go to the Alumni Association. So thank you very much. Um, we do have some uh, food and beverages at the back. And please do stick around, network. Um, you can come and meet the panelists personally. And then uh, we do have some books available for purchase, and any of the authors are willing to personally sign them for you as well. So thank you so much for coming. And uh, we hope to have you again at another panel event in the future. Thank you.